Welcome. This is a short lecture that I presented to my residents during a simulation day, so I thought I'd record it over and share it with the rest of you. We're going to get into the discussion about emergent pacing. Now we're going to focus on some of the practical aspects and not so much some of the clinical aspects, but how to set up the pacer and how to activate it and all those fun things. Now remember, this does replace manufacturer recommendations, etc., and more disclaimers. And of course, this is very equipment based, so it may be very different at your institution compared to the equipment that I'm going to talk about today. We have some indications that we can discuss symptomatic bradycardia, atrioventricular block, and of course, the need for overdrive pacing. However, most commonly in the ED, you're going to be talking about the situation of the third degree block and the unstable patient. But there's many other indications and situations where you would need. Uh, emergent pacing. However, we're not really going to get into that. We're going to skip ahead to the practical aspects. Now, we could talk about transcutaneous versus transvenous pacing. And we're going to start off with transcutaneous pacing because that's what you're going to be able to get on board sooner and quicker and try and stabilize your patient. So one of the things that you have to make sure when you're doing transcutaneous pacing, like on our diagram here, is that your pads are placed appropriately. You want that right chest pad on the right side and you want that left apical pad near the apex. Now, you could do an anterior posterior configuration but sometimes that's a little difficult rolling someone who's unstable or unresponsive. Now, many times a pad ends up in the wrong spot. And if that happens and you're not getting captured, be aware that you may have to move the pad to get better capture. And just make sure your pads are appropriate so that that electricity can travel through the heart for your pacing attempt. The next step is to take your defibrillator slash pacing system and figure out where your pacer controls are. On this system, the pacer controls are there on the handle over on the right side of your screen outlined in red. What you have are several key functions here. The first step is to turn the pacer function on. And when you do that, the screen appears and you have that little box there that has the pacer information there. Pacer stop, meaning it's not actively pacing. The mode, the pulses per minute, and the power output. Number two is you're going to select the mode. Now you can do fixed mode or demand mode. And in this system, when you're on a fixed mode, highlighted here, fixed mode means that pacing system is gonna beat and fire at 70 pulses per minute. If the patient has a heart rate of 20, it's gonna fire at 70. If it has a heart rate of 50, it's gonna fire at 70. If the patient has a heart rate of 100, it's still gonna fire at 70. It's gonna fire at 70 no matter what. Now the key reason why this is important is because if you need a fixed rate, this is a setting you wanna be on. The other point is, that the pacemaker, the transcutaneous pacemaker, cannot sense and pace through the pads. It can pace through the pads, but it needs leads to sense. So if it's in a demand mode, it needs uh, additional leads. However, in fixed mode, all you need is the pads because it doesn't have to sense. It's firing in a fixed manner. Once again, all you need is the pads. And that's key. That's one less thing to set up, one less piece of equipment that may be lost or malfunctioning or not available or cause some confusion every time trying to get things hooked up. Step three is you're gonna set your rate and your output, output or power. Now there's a little discussion here and some people vary on this. You wanna set your rate higher than what the patient is natively doing so you can get capture and get to a good rate for a hemodynamic stability. The question comes on power. It can range up to 200 milliamps depending on what system you're using. But some people advocate starting low and then working your way up to get capture. Some people advocate starting high and working your way down to you lose capture and then bumping back up to have capture. And some of this depends on the patient's situation. If they're very unstable and obtunded and unconscious, I'd rather start off at a much higher power so I get quick capture to stabilize my patient. And if they're unconscious and unresponsive, the discomfort of the pacing is really no longer an issue. If they're awake with me and mildly symptomatic, I would rather start low and work my way up. However, different situations call for different uh, measures. So just keep that in mind. The last button, the start stop, is what turns on the pacing function and turns it off. Now, here I have highlighted the screen if you're in demand mode. Now, demand mode means that the pacemaker is only gonna fire a pulse when it needs to be. So if the patient has a heart rate of 80, it's gonna fire no pulses because it's set at 70. So the patient uh, has a rate higher than what the pacemaker is set at. If you have a native rate of 20, it's gonna fire 50 pulses per minute in order to get it up to 70. It's gonna sense what the patient's doing and it's gonna make up the extra that's needed. However, like I said, it can't sense and pace through the pads. It needs leads to sense and the pads to pace. Easiest way is you take your ECG monitor leads and you plug it into the back of the machine. 
And you can see here that area that's highlighted is your standard ECG leads from our monitor. And it says ECG in, which makes it much simpler. So the ECG leads there, you can see, are the same on the side of our monitor and plug right into the back of the system. What's nice is um, you just unplug the cable from the room monitor, plug it right into the biphasic defibrillator slash pacer. Now, this is the part that confuses people and always causes angst when you're trying to pace, is if you're set to demand mode and you need to slave cable from the monitor to the pacemaker, the transcutaneous pacemaker, and to have it in demand mode. And this is the part where you need extra equipment and it always causes angst, what connects to what, how do you hook X up to Y. And remember, if you have an unstable patient, fixed mode absolves you of the need for a slave cable or ECG leads because you're just gonna fire through the pads. However, if you do wanna put in demand mode because you have a semi-conscious patient and they're somewhat stable, this is what you wanna do. And you can see that it's the cable here and you can see that on the left side of your screen, we have a turn so we can see those ECG multi-pin connector. And then you can see that the ends of the cable are very different, which tells you what different ends go to different places. So what you want to do is have the patient. You're going to have leads on the patient that go to your monitor. And so everyone can see the room monitor, see what rhythm the patient's in. Monitors are going to be connected by a slave cable to the pacemaker slash defibrillator. And the pacemaker slash defibrillator is going to be connected to the patient by pads. So the rhythm will be sent through the leads to the monitor and slave to the pacer. And the pacer connects with pads to the patient in order to actually pace them. So you can see the two ends of the wire. There's the multi-pin connector, which goes into the pacemaker through the ECG end port. And the stereo headphone jack that plugs into the side of the monitor. All right, so let's talk about transvenous pacing. You're gonna need some different supplies for this. Ideally, you're gonna want a venous sheath. You're gonna need a, the pacing wire or catheter. You're gonna need a pacing generator. Ideally, you want some extension cable to connect the pacing wire to the generator. And you're gonna need sterile precautions because remember, you're putting a wire into a patient's heart. You don't wanna do this unsterily unless you're, it's a really emergent and life-threatening situation. So ideally, in your facility, if you're going to be doing this often, you'll have a nice setup. You'll have a procedure card that allows you to do transcutaneous pacing and transvenous pacing with all your equipment, and you have them separated by drawers. You're going to need the pacing catheters. You're going to need the sheets. You're going to need the generator, extension cable, and some extra supplies. Now, this brings up an important point. Depending on what brand or what type of catheter you have, what you're looking for is a venous sheath introducer. Now, some people will say, I want to use the quote-unquote Cordis. Remember, Cordis is a brand, and Cordis makes a lot of different things, just like Arrow makes a lot of different things. What you're looking for is a percutaneous sheath introducer. And if you have a kit where you have a sterile drapes and all the needed um, accessories, that's even better. When you look at an introducer sheath, the sheath size is the internal diameter of that sheath. The pacer wire is named for its size of the external diameter. And so what that means is that this six French sheath will fit a six French pacer wire through it because the internal diameter of the sheet is six French, the external diameter of the wire is six French. So they fit. And if you're unsure on the kit, it will usually tell you. So this one says it fits four to six French catheters. What you don't wanna do is put like an eight and a half French sheath in to put a five French wire through. Because the problem is that seal on the end of these catheters will not work as well. And with every beat of the heart, you can get some blood leakage from that area, which, you know, makes you look bad and is always bad for the patient to have blood squirting out of their body with every beat of the heart. So you want to make sure they're matched. You want to make sure your sheath is the right size for the catheter you're using. Now, this is what some of your supplies are going to look like. You're going to get your pacing wire. It's going to be in a sealed package that you're going to pull out. It's going to have a little protective sleeve on there. Now, this is going to be sterile. Your extension wire and your pacing generator. The extension wire is usually sterile also. I just want to draw your attention to the syringe here that's in with your pacing wire. Do not lose that syringe, it is very important. And we'll go over why later. The other thing you're gonna need is a battery and the battery goes in the bottom of your pacing generator. Ideally, always put in a fresh battery. Now, how do you open that battery door? Because everything on that temporary transvenous pacing generator has to undergo deliberate action in order to produce something. And the reason that is, is because they don't want things accidentally happening to it to change the rhythm, change the rate, or disconnect it. So to open that battery door, it's two buttons on the side of the generator. You depress both buttons, and the door slides out, and there's your 9-volt battery. 
depending on where you are, what you can do for non-image guided placement of these transvenous pacers, you can use the balloon tip or flow directed pacing catheter. Now different brands will call it different things, but you wanna make sure it's the right size. So for this, I would be putting in a six French venous sheath like I showed you and a five French balloon tip or flow directed pacing catheter. And this shows you the little difference and I have access to both. We have the straight catheter here on the right, which is the flow directed. And you can see that the balloon is inflated there and the balloon protects the tip a little bit. So there's less chance the tip can puncture the wall. On the left side, we have this pacing catheter that has a curve built into it. This is called a right heart curve catheter. And the way the catheter is curved is so that as it goes through the IJ, it'll sit against the inferior wall of the right ventricle and curve that tip so that the bipolar lead sits at the right, a right ventricular apex. And you know, it's curved specifically to sit in the right ventricle from the IJ approach. This is how the balloon works. You inflate it, the balloon inflates, and you can see that the balloon extends nearly to the tip of that bipolar lead, kind of protecting it so you're less likely to puncture through, say, the right ventricle. Now, this brings up another piece in that pacing kit you may have noticed that I haven't really talked about yet, these pin connectors. Now, these pin connectors can be attached to the end of the electrode leads for your pacing catheter. However, there's a couple ways this can be used. One is, if it connects to the end of the catheter, you can then use an alligator clamp or your EKG lead to clamp onto that end of that connector and sense where that catheter is. And you can look at the rhythm and the type of uh, waveform you get. And is that waveform a right atrial waveform? Is that a right ventricular waveform? Are you out in the pulmonary artery? Are you in the IBC? And you can kind of try to figure out where your catheter is if you're having trouble getting capture and you're getting lost. The other thing that some people will tell you is that you put those pin connectors on so you can plug it into your generator. And you can see here on the left side of your screen on that generator, there's a positive and negative insert. And yes, you can plug the pacing pin connectors into there, but once again, they're pin connectors. They slide out and in very easily. And sliding out is less than ideal if you're trying to stabilize somebody's rhythm. You don't want your pacing catheter and your generator to become disconnected. So the first step is to place the venous sheath in the patient. And you want to place it in the right internal jugular or the left subclavian ideally in order to curve that catheter into the right heart. Now, I prefer to do a right internal jugular if at all possible so that the left subclavian can be saved for the permanent pacemaker. Now, while we do these procedures, it's going to be demonstrated on these uh, phantoms and these models in a non-sterile fashion. And the reason is because the drapes and everything would inhibit our ability to show you all the different things and what's going on. But when you're doing this in real life, sterile precautions are important. So once you've accessed the vein, ultrasound guided cannulation, you're gonna drop your wire in, and what you wanna do is place this venous sheath. And if you've never placed a venous sheath before, it's a little different than your normal central venous catheters. The way it comes is the sheath comes with the dilator through the end, not in the port. So as you're gonna see, we have to take the catheter, we have to pull the dilator out from one end, and we're gonna insert it through that sealing port at the end, and the dilator sits inside of the catheter. We're gonna make sure that side port has been flushed and is well clamped or sealed so that it doesn't bleed. We're gonna thread this over our wire just like any other catheter that we would place in. Now, once the catheter is inserted, we're gonna insert that catheter to full depth, right? It's short enough that we can insert it to full depth. Now, you're gonna pull the dilator and the wire out in one smooth motion. And what that does is that pulls the wire out and it pulls the internal dilator up because you can see the dilator goes through the end of that sealing port. Now that port seals and there's no bleeding and that's where you're gonna float your pacer wire through. This can be done as a two-step procedure. So you have an unstable patient and you decide to put in the venous sheath because you may need to pace them, but right now you don't. This can be done as a two-step process depending on the type of kit you have. And that's where this end cap comes in. You see it's packaged separately in the kit. It's sealed to maintain sterility. So if you open the kit to place the line, but you don't need that cap, you can save it for later, it's still sealed. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna open it up. It fits onto the end of the catheter. You can see here, there's a little notched groove in it. And it fits over the hub of this catheter. There's a little knurled little nub there that's gonna slide in, it's gonna lock in place. And the reason you do this is if you can imagine, you've maintained sterile precautions, that cap now covers the end of the venous sheath. That top of the venous sheath where you would thread the wire is protected and maintains sterility. So you can now sterilize and float a wire in later. Let's talk about setting up your pacer. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna get your extension cable and you're gonna see those connectors. You're gonna take the electro connectors of your pacing catheter and plug it in. 
negative to negative, positive to positive. And this is a little more stable than those pin connectors. Now the next step is to take this toothed or ridged connector that will slide over that and make sure that the electrode connectors from the pacing catheter are locked in extension wire. And this is one more safety feature. You can see here that your negative end of your pacing catheter electrode plugs into the negative thing on your extension wire and positive to positive. Then this uh, T-port with those little ridges locks in place and holds everything together. So as you pull on the wire or something pulls on the generator, they do not become disconnected. The end of the extension wire would be given to your non-sterile assistant that plugs into the end of the generator there and clicks in place. And you can see from that tug that it's not going to come out, unlike pin connectors. You're now going to turn on your generator and set your three dials. Now, let's go over what those dials are. You can see your generator here. It's got a nice big plastic sheet over it to protect those dials and the on and off switch. We slide that cover back to gain access to the buttons and the dials. Now, the first dial, the rate, or pulses per minute, you're gonna set that above your patient's native rate or what you're transcutaneously pacing them at. So you could transcutaneously pace a patient to stabilize them while you get ready to place a temporary transvenous pacer, right? So you're gonna set it above their native rate or above what you're transcutaneously pacing them at. I tend to put it 20 beats higher. That way, once I get captured with the transvenous pacer, I can see it on the monitor a little quicker than if it was just 10. Here's your power output. Now, if you're going for capture with transvenous pacer, you're gonna set it to max power output. We can adjust this later based on the patient. Now, sensitivity while you're trying to gain capture, you're gonna set it to asynchronous because you want to get good capture. Now you can set it to a demand mode later, but right now for capture, you're gonna set it to asynchronous or fixed. So let's talk about getting that wire in and in correct position. First thing is you're gonna take this uh, sheath that comes in your kit and you're going to thread the wire through it. You're then going to pull that sheath far out of your way so it's not in your way as you manipulate the wire. But you need to put this in place first and we'll get to what happens later. The next step is figuring out whether your balloon works. You don't want to put a flow directed pacing catheter in place and the balloon doesn't work. The way the balloon works is the stopcock is on, you push down the syringe, the balloon inflates, you turn the stopcock off, balloon stays inflated. You turn the stopcock again, and the balloon deflates. Now, the catheter is going to be set to have that special syringe that can only inject the amount of air you need to inflate that balloon. You don't want to use a separate syringe because if you inject too much air, you could potentially rupture the balloon. And that's not something you want to do. Now, you may do this sterilely, or you may hand this off to a non-sterile assistant to, do, to manipulate the syringe and the stopcock for you. The next step you're going to do is you're going to put the wire through that back of that venous sheath, which seals around it, and you're going to thread it in. Now the wire has several marks on it. It has a bar for every 10 centimeters. So you want to drop it to at least two bar or 20 centimeters because that will get you past the sheath and into the SVC. You're now going to inflate your balloon, turn your stopcock to keep that balloon inflated, or have your non-sterile assistant do that and you're going to advance the wire. And you can see that wire exiting the bottom of the insert, heading into the right ventricle. Now, what happens is that balloon works as sort of like a sail. So as blood flow is going through the SVC into the right atrium and into the right ventricle, as you feed the wire, theoretically the blood flow will help pull that balloon in the right direction that you want to go, into the right ventricle. You can also look at it from an image guidance standpoint with a person down below. And you're going to do this either by image guidance, say fluoroscopy or ultrasound here, or you're going to do it blindly just by monitoring. So if you're doing it by ultrasound guidance, of course, I have to bring up ultrasound. We're going to see that balloon. It just passed the tricuspid valve. And you can see that as the heart beats, that balloon bounces a little bit as the leaflet hits it. This patient, you can see that the wire is getting past the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. And you can see that wire slowly being advanced to the tip of the right ventricle until we get capture. So you can easily do this under ultrasound guidance. The pacing wire is echogenic with foreign body reverb artifact, or it has a lot of reverb artifact because of the balloon. Now, ideally, what you want to do is you're going to roll the wire and you're going to thread it through the SVC into the right atrium, past the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle. 
and seed it right in the apex of the right ventricle. However, things aren't always ideal, and sometimes the pacing wire may exit into the coronary sinus, it may go into the IVC, or it may go out the pulmonary artery. So if you see that your patient is coughing a lot, hiccuping, or all of a sudden your ventilator is firing for high frequency or something like that, you may be in the IVC pacing their diaphragm. If all of a sudden you reach a large amount of the wire in place, like say maybe 50 centimeters or something, you know you've gone past the right ventricle. You're either in the IVC or in the pulmonary artery. In that case, deflate your balloon and pull your catheter back. You don't want to pull the inflated balloon through a valve. What you want to do is deflate the balloon and pull it back till you're into the right atrium, which you can do by length or by image guidance. Then you're going to inflate your balloon and once again try to get it through the right atrium, tricuspid valve, and into the right ventricular apex. You can see here on this ultrasound image, we have a wire that exited the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle and then curled in the ventricle and actually went out the pulmonary artery. In this case, we pull the wire back into the right atrium and we try to thread it again. And as you saw in a previous clip, we were able to seat the catheter well and paste that patient. What you're looking for, whether it's image guidance or just purely blind, you're looking for pacing capture. And one of the things you want to look for is all of a sudden you're going to convert from whatever native rhythm you saw or transcutaneously pace rhythm to a paced left bundle branch block pattern that you're used to because you have that pacer lead seated in the right ventricle pacing. And it's going to be at the rate that you set on your pacemaker generator, which is why you want to make sure it's different than the patient's native rate or the transcutaneous rate. Once you get capture, you're going to deflate your balloon. The reason being the balloon works as a sail to pull your catheter into the right ventricle, but as blood flows, it can also work as a sail to pull it out. So once you have good capture and your catheter seated well, deflate that balloon. The next step with that wire in place is to take that sheet that we initially put on the wire and pulled back out of our way before, and we're going to slide that all the way down onto the hub of the venous sheath. It has a little knurl on there. It's going to lock in place. And once you lock that down so it doesn't disconnect, you're going to pull that plastic sheath back over. You can notice that they're holding the wire so you don't dislodge the wire. You're going to pull that sheath back. And then you're going to curl it around. Now the purpose of that plastic sheath is to protect the wire. So if that wire becomes slightly dislodged or capture no longer works as the patient's manipulated and moved, you still have a sterile amount of wire that's in that plastic sheath to adjust. And the next step is you're going to curl the catheter like that so that you can suture in where the catheter crosses itself and in a few other points onto the patient to stabilize it, to secure it in place. The sheath has already been sutured in place, now you're going to suture the pacing wire in place to keep it from getting dislodged. And at this point, you have capture, you can turn down the rate to what you want, and you can turn down the power to what you want. Great placement means you need less than 1 milliamp to pace, less than 5 is acceptable. If you need more power than that to pace, your catheter tip is probably not where you want it to be. There could also be scar tissue and other issues, but this is something to talk about with the consultants who are admitting the patient to the ICU, that maybe we need to take the patient to the fluoroscopy suite to reseed that catheter or manipulate it. And then you can also switch them from an asynchronous mode to a demand mode and change the sensitivity as needed. The next step is your follow-up chest x-ray to make sure everything is where you need it to be. You can see in this patient that the transcutaneous pads were well placed. There's a right chest pad and a left chest pad and that left pad is over by the apex so that electrical current as you're pacing that patient is going directly through the heart. There was good cutaneous capture there. Then the other part was that the pacing catheter is in place. And while there's many wires in place, what you can do is you can look at that curve of that pacing catheter and it goes all the way to the tip where you see that bipolar lead. You see those two dots, you know that's your pacing catheter. It's at the tip of the right ventricle, not the left ventricle, but the right ventricle. Now some of you as a student observer may have noticed a central venous catheter in place there in the right internal jugular space also. Now this is what's called a tandem line. This is what we used to do sometimes for Swan-Ganz catheter patients where we would float the swan through the introducer and place a triple lumen above it or, and both in the same internal jugular vein to have one area for central venous access and site care. But since we're not doing swans anymore, this is something that you may not see very often. Now remember, you can always find extra videos and more things here on YouTube. You can find them on my blog. You can follow me on Twitter. And if you like the video, go ahead and click on subscribe to see more when things pop up.